Good evening, and welcome once again to the Shadow Gallery. I am, as always, your host, James Donnelly. And while it is not quite time for new comics, bitches, um, we do have something to that. Well, we, I have something to discuss. Now, this is kind of a special edition, if you will, because I'm going to take some time to talk about one comic book that came out last week. And it's something that, while entertaining me, and there were moments that I absolutely loved, there were some moments that just seem like it's maybe getting out of control. And so we're going to talk about just this this one comic, and it's a comic that's very near and dear to my heart, and I wouldn't have quite so much issue with it as, as, I, as I do if it weren't so near and dear to my heart. And that is The Shadow Number 3. Now, I'm, I'm showing you this cover because I'm going to take the risk that uh, they won't take this down. But anyway, first of all, just look at... This is the, uh, this is the John Cassidy variant, and it is literally one of the most beautiful covers I've seen in a while, which is why I, 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 I've asked my comic shop to only give me the Cassidy covers uh, from here on out, because he just does such beautiful work. I mean, just with the way with the that his scarf becomes the S. That's not on any of the other variants, uh, you know. And the kind of screaming souls within his cloak, and then of course the city in the background, and the twin forty fives in his hand. Now, I got into this book, this particular volume version, whatever you want to call it, of the Shadow full of the knowledge that this was a Garth Ennis book, that Garth Ennis was going to be writing it. Now, obviously there have been a lot of different people over the years that have written The Shadow, um, from Denny O'Neill to uh, uh, Gerard Jones uh, to... Howard Chaikin, to Andy Helfer, uh, and, uh, you know, Kaluta himself, uh, you know, Mike Kaluta himself wrote and illustrated a couple of issues, uh, three issue uh, series for Dark Horse called In the Coils of Leviathan. Um, and now we have Garth Ennis. Now everybody has put, of course, their own kind of unique spin on this character. Now the the two comics that have been the most, if you will, respect that have been the most respectful to the character of the Shadow have been uh, the original work, well not the original work, but I mean the the first real comic from uh, Denny O'Neill and Mike Kaluta and then the and then the series the shadow strikes now like i said i knew that garth ennis was going to put his own spin on it and he has shown that he he has and he you know and he's got a really really good handle on the character of the shadow and he knows the places that he wants to take it he wants to take it in a direction that we haven't seen from the shadow before now, and this is where it gets uh, a little dicey, is that as we have, as those of us who know the Shadow knows that the Shadow has primarily operated out of New York City. And, you know, in the 30s, he, he was a, a detective. You know, it was a pulp detective thriller. That's what it was. And it stayed that way, you know, throughout 
uh, you know, obviously Walter Gibson's uh, all the novels that he did for The Shadow, it stayed that way through its first incarnation in comic book form with uh, O'Neill and Kaluta. And then it, it changed when it got to Howard Chaikin, who said, you know what, let's, let's play around with this guy a little bit. You know, let's take him out of the 30s, put him in the present day. Um, but it was still, you know, he was fighting the scum of New York. And even when Andy Helfer took it over, I mean, it went off in a like kind of a crazy direction, which was one of the reasons I kind of stopped reading it uh, during like the Helfer Baker years. And then, but then the Shadow Strikes came in, and that was like it was like the Shadow in its most distilled form. It was, you know, it was the '30s. You know, he was, you know, again just fighting. Uh, you know, uh, you know, solving murders, and uh, you know, kind of helping to uh, kind of not keep the you know, but to I don't know. It just it really had a handle on the the characters, and now we're at Garth Ennis, and Garth Ennis has essentially, he's excised uh, the, basically all of the other supporting characters. They're all gone. You know, from, you know, Harry Vincent to Commissioner Weston to Inspector Cardona uh, to Shrevey, you know, and the list, you know, Roy Tam, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And it's just been Lamont Cranston, Kent Allard as Lamont Cranston, and Margot Lane. Those are the only two recognizable faces. Um, and then, you know, we have our main villains of this piece uh, being, uh, uh, you know, Taro Kondo, uh, you know, a, a Japanese intelligence officer, and... Uh, Uh, and uh, as a general, um, General Akamatsu. Um, now Kondo is kind of a, and of course in this in this particular issue we are introduced to Buffalo Wong, who is this huge, you know, burly, you know, he's kind of like he looks kind of like Hagrid, <laughs> um, and he's. You know he's filthy, he's disgusting, uh, but he's you know he's brutally efficient. He's a very typical Garth Ennis villain. Um, you know it's you know kind of like for instance like the Russian in the Punisher, or you know kind of like the character of Love Sausage in The Boys. Uh, you know it's like it's a very typical Garth Ennis comic book villain. And we have in this issue, basically, it opens with a very typical Garth Ennis uh, way. Because we have, basically, it's a, a transport full of, um, full of Russian soldiers. Uh, and they're talking about, you know, this, this mission that they're on. It's, you know, it's going to be very important to, to them. And, you know, the, you know, the sky's the limit. Then all of a sudden, the, you know, the plane... Uh, sharply turns and it's not turning because it's you know because they have they had to turn suddenly it's being fired upon by Japanese zeros um, and then it kind of you know kind of falls out of the sky and then one of those you know and one of the the soldiers is you know it's like you know this is not the way it was supposed to you know this can't be how it ends for and then you know cut off dead um you know, it's very, very typical of Garth Ennis to have, you know, people kind of talking up everything that great that's going to happen, and then, boom, okay, we're going to switch that off, and we're going to have something really horrible happen to them. Um, now, 
this issue is a very Garth Ennis issue. Garth Ennis is a brilliant writer. I I do not, in general, have a problem with him. But in one problem, well, the one problem that I have with him over and over is very evident in this book. This book is filled with exposition. It is a lot of you know a lot of expository uh, monologues, uh, a lot of expository dialogue. Um, you know, very little to, you know, and then, of course, this this does bring out the character, but its its main focus seems to be, here's information for you. Here is a, you know, you are engorging yourself on information about our plans, about, you know, what I've done, you know, the Kondo and uh, Akamutsu uh, talk endlessly uh you know about how they're subverting all of the you know all of the the different forces that are aligned against them and and Kondo's vast uh, you know uh, his vast network of like informants and spies and, and so on and so forth and then we get to uh, Cranston in Shanghai he's meeting with he, he has already um, uh, a naval, uh, an American uh, naval uh, commander at his table, and uh, Mr. Finnegan, uh, who is the uh, government agent that has come to meet Cranston in Shanghai to put this plan into motion that Cranston has essentially orchestrated, and you know the you know the. The naval commander essentially he's taking his uh, his marching orders from Cranston, even though Finnegan is an actual agent of the government, and you know he's running the show. But Cranston makes it very clear that this guy is definitely not running the show. That Cranston is running the show. He's got the intel. He's got the purpose. He's got the means, and and that's all that anybody needs to know. So it's what's great though about this issue is what a terrific handle Garth Ennis has on the character of of the shadow of you know Kent Allard and well, Lamont Cranston and the character of the shadow because they are somewhat different but you know they do speak essentially the same language except you know Cranston's weapons are more his 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 words and his attitude and you know he plays you know kind of at being the nonchalant uh, kind of you know you know he's the guy who knows that he's the smartest guy sitting at the table and you know he plays him as someone who's very uh you know very distinguished uh very smart and very arrogant and that's great like i said i mean that he's got it right on and then he when he is alone kind of being allard with uh you know for instance in the sequence in the scenes that he has with margot lane uh, he you know, is he basically makes his declaration known that you know because Margot is she's thinking about the the woman that she had to kill in the previous issue where they were set upon by uh, the Abwehr, the you know the, the the Nazis basically, and you know she's having some trouble with that and you know that she basically watched her burn watched this the. Uh, the woman that she killed, like, she burned alive. She was shot with a flare gun. Um, and Cranston Allard grabs her wrist and says, you know, basically, you know, let it be known from here on out, this is, we're not in New York City anymore. You know, the fate of millions is at stake. We are at war. 
and you know she makes a comment you know it's like you're hurting my arm you know when he's grabbing it like that because he's being so forceful and you know those are moments when Allard sticks out his head and said you know basically you get the feeling that this is a guy who's done some pretty nasty shit in his life and if there were a shadow before him he'd probably be the guy that would be marked for you know utter annihilation because he's you know he has done evil which is why he said you know that in the last issue he said you know that's kind of why he can you know he knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men because he has it in his own heart uh, so that the the shadow himself is you know this avenging you know kind of angel of justice but you know it's out of a purpose of knowing that evil exists and if he could have probably stopped himself when he was evil then he probably would have now what that evil is we don't know because the, again this is Ennis's interpretation which which is why Ennis said it not in you know 1930s New York City he said it you know at the very kind of beginnings of World War II because if there's a writer out there who knows World War II as good as Garth Ennis does, I don't know if I don't know where they are or if they even exist because he has done probably the definitive uh, war comics of the last decade. I mean, just with war stories and Garth Ennis's battlefields and everything like that. This is a guy who is obviously studied, knows, and has a a great wealth of knowledge of World War Two, and almost a respect, you know, kind of a respect for what people were fighting for and uh, and the people that they were fighting against. So, um, and then we, but, you know, and then we have this ama you know, amazing, beautiful moment where the shadow has clouded the minds of these, these men that are after Cranston to, to kill him and he disappears kind of against a wall and they walk by and they see a painting but it's really the shadow right there he just sticks the gun that guy's at, you know right in the guy's head you know right right at the guy's head and just pulls the trigger and he kills the you know he dispatches the rest of them very quickly um that's a very you know that's a very kind of ennis shadow thing to do because like i said before this is a guy who has mixed his uh you know, he's mixed being uh, the shadow of the comics with the shadow of, like, the radio shows. And, you know, he has mental abilities to cloud men's minds. And, you know, he uses the Girasol or the, the fire opal. Like, you know, he's the guy that he's actually shot in the head, he pulls back from death to answer his questions and he goes charging into you know through uh, you know through a skylight to just with a with the Thompson submachine gun to just annihilate everybody who's there um, and you know that's where the comic becomes awesome now the other problem that I am having though is with the art of Aaron Campbell now pretty much every artist, the best artists I've ever seen on The Shadow, there are three of them. There are, uh, there's Kaluta, you know, that goes without saying. Then there is Howard Chaikin, who did him so beautifully. And then there is, uh, there was Eduardo Barreto. Um, who did the first several issues of The Shadow Strikes. He really had the whole look down of all these individual characters. You know, kind of, you know, Cranston with this kind of, not large nose, but this very kind of well-defined profile, so that when you saw him, you know, from an angle, you, okay, this is definitely The Shadow. You know, when he, you know, it's kind of almost, you know, the, the nose is very angular. 
it's like you know here and then like you know kind of almost like straight down. It's, it's very very angular, and that's kind of the classic uh, look to the shadow. Um, and mo I say you know Chaikin because Chaikin is just a great artist all around, but also. Uh, of course, Kaluta, he really had that look down as well and gave uh, every character a very individual look. Aaron Campbell is not, sadly, that good of an artist. He, he is a good artist, to be certain, but it is actually hard to distinguish one character's, at least one male character's face from another throughout this book other than the color of their hair. That's really the only way that you can tell. Um... And that's problematic for me because it says that, you know, this is, you know, this is a creative team that has created two really excellent issues of comics. And then it's kind of, you know, now that we've gotten to the third issue, it's kind of like, eh, we're going to kind of, you know, we're just going to let things kind of flow for a little while. And it's starting and then the flaws with it start really coming out. So, as a whole, I would still give this issue a 4 out of 5, but it's just that I don't want this to become another NS series where it has, you know, because he's worked with some really great people over the years, and they're art styles has been very distinct. I think that one of the problems with Aaron Campbell is that his art style is kind of homogenized. Like I said, I mean, it, it's not, it doesn't really stand out. Characters look very similar to one another. Um, and the movement isn't incredibly dynamic. And, you know, there's no real, like, posturing, and which makes me sad that people like John Cassidy and Alex Ross and so on and so forth have basically foregone the art of making, uh, of doing full issues of comics and have just kind of consigned themselves to doing covers. Um, you know, like most of the artists currently working on before Watchmen are very much like that. Um, you know, people like Jay Lee and like Amanda Connor and, uh, you know, J.G. Jones and, and so on and so forth. I mean, these are people that really, uh, they've just kind of made, you know, made their bones by just doing covers. They don't do interiors anymore. And that is something that's, it's starting to bother me uh, about artists in general because, you know, I, lo I would love to see John Cassidy or Alex Ross. I mean, Al okay, Alex, Alex Ross, he can do covers for as long as he wants. He's entitled. He d obviously has a much uh, deeper um, respect for doing kind of like a painted art rather than just kind of going at it from, you know, a bunch of different directions. You know, John Cassidy, he, he's obviously done monthly comics before. So it's like, you know, kind of pick it up again, dude. But anyway, so that's that's really it for tonight for my examination, this long examination into this, which is why I want to do this separately from, because my, my other fucking review show is long enough. So, um, but... I, I doubt that each, uh, you know, that each review of the shadow is going to be this long. It's just that this one bothered me the most out of the out of the three issues so far. So I guess, like I said, it's still a four out of five. It's still a very solidly told story, but I think that Ennis needs to kind of reel it in a little bit and get back to uh, not the action, but just making things seem to move along. A little bit at a better pace because that is a problem that he runs into a lot as a writer anyway so if this is your first time here I'm obviously a big shadow fan if you like the shadow hey subscribe hey if you like comic books subscribe because I've got my weekly vlogs here and tomorrow night will be my next one so um, and you know we'll go you know into less detail about more comics um, 
So, you know, subscribe, like it, dislike it, comment, please comment. Because uh, if you don't like it, I don't know why you don't. Um, and if you do like it, I'd like to know why you like it. So, you know, and I'll have my, I'm sure I'll have my links for Twitter and everything like that. Um, so, uh, that's it. So, uh, to all of you out there, again, thank you for stopping by. This is James Donnelly for the Shadow Gallery signing off, reminding you to stay in the shadow.